So, like I said earlier in the earlier when we start when we started the class. So this also works with vegetables. It also works with you know maybe you planted pepper in your backyard, vegetables, you know, and things like that. I mean the specification. It also works just that in vegetables in vegetables and fruits, you know, and all this, specification is not always stated. It's not always like there's a specific kind of uh, specification for you to export that same vegetable. So what you are working at is to make sure that, oh, before I can export this thing, I need to put it in a condition whereby it won't spoil. So that's okay. Uh, okay, let me use um let me use yam. Let me use yam in that for that example. We know yam, we understand yam, uh, everyone eats yam, but Nigerians, especially in this side, we have a very huge problem when it comes to exporting yam. Because by, by the time the yam gets to wherever it's going to, boom, it's spoiled. Uh, another example is beans, is beans. Like um, I've exported beans to Europe about maybe four times now. Those, uh, those beans, by the time it's in the container for about two months, Yes, like that's about seven weeks, about seven weeks. By the time it gets cleared over there. In fact, opening, just opening the container it might just be the weevil that will greet you, you know, that will tell you, hi, you are welcome. You know, so it's all these, those, these are just like few challenges that we, 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 we usually face. So for, Yam, for instance, before you can export yam, you know, let's say you are using a shorter route, which is air freight to export your yam, you, you already have the understanding that it's not going to spoil. Because if it spoils, you, you are losing money. The buyer that also pays you, maybe the buyer pays you $500 or $200, whatever the person pays you. The person might also request for his money. So you've lost like in two different ways. In fact, you've even lost more. So for that yam exportation, for you to export yam or vegetables like that or other things in that kind of area that has to do with just food, uh, you know, food stuff, food items, you don't need a specific focused kind of specification for you to export them. What you need is to make sure that they are in a condition that they can't spoil, that they can't spoil. That's what you need. But when you are exporting soybeans, dried split ginger, cashew nuts, season seeds, shear nuts, you know, this kind of ground, even ground nuts, maize and all that. Gra uh, maize has its own specification like a buyer can tell you that the maize i want you to send me i want it harvested in 2021 i want it to have so so uh humidity i want it to be white or maybe i want it to be yellow or maybe i want it to be red i want it to you know i want so so property in it so now the maybe there is that why packing it into the bag and all that there will be a particular percentage of foreign matter, which is dead, that has to be in, in the bag of the maize that you packed. So that at least, let's even say, we allow foreign matter to be in, in this maize, it should not be more than maybe 20%, or maybe it should not be more than 10% or 15% or there about. So your buyer will give you all this kind of specification. It is very, important it is very important so but when you are doing vegetables food items food stuffs and all that fish uh, you know whatever the case might be you are the one in the in in position to make sure that 
you put that product or item into a state, into a condition that it won't spoil at least, you know, four months. It's not going to spoil four months, five months, you know, it's still very fine. It's uh, still very, very okay. So uh, what are your processing procedures like the machinery or the equipment? What type of equipment are you using to process? Because uh, your, your final product or the end product of what you want to export, the processing methods that you used will also tell. It is, it is going to tell on it. So some items might have colors. They might just bring out different colors by the time you are packing it inside bags, maybe your ginger, maybe your pepper, maybe um, your turmeric, or whatever that you're actually looking at. So actually, even uh, I have some people that, that process tomatoes. Those tomatoes, they, there's a way they, they, they dry them inside this very giant, giant oven, you know. So, and uh, strawberries, different kinds of berries, uh, even mango, mango um, orange. So you can dry, you can export dried mangoes. The, after you've you know, cut out the seed out of it, the remaining can be dried. And there are companies that use it for, for uh, snacks, for in production of snacks, you know, fruits, fruit snacks, in production of juice, drinks, you know, and, or, and flavor. You know, some even use it for flavor and different things. Like that. So some of the things that can affect color of the product is, is the way you actually process your commodity, the machines that you use. So I know that uh, importing equipment is very expensive because of the you know, of the levy and all that that you pay to customs in Nigeria of, of the charges and all that. So, but even if we are using locally fabricated equipment, are they of good standard, are they of quality standard? Is this something that maybe it won't rust? It has already rusted, but we are still just using it like that. So by the time the, the corn, the white corn is coming out, it's, it's dirty, it's looking dirty, it's looking having stained colors. You know, so all these things are just one of those things that we need to look at in order to satisfy our clients, in order to satisfy our clients. Then uh, which country or uh, location are we targeting for our farm produce? So do we have a location in mind? Do we have maybe China, Vietnam, India, do we have a country in mind that we're actually looking at that, you know, for this farm produce, you know, for this crop, this is where it's actually going, or this continent is where I'm actually looking at to send it. So it might be based on your preference that maybe they pay more in that country, or maybe they, they maybe buyers from that country, maybe, or from that area, maybe they pay more uh premium maybe they pay premium price for that commodity like for instance one of my clients came to nigeria uh, a few weeks ago so while we met last week uh one of the uh, he has we actually got him uh shea butter as a sample for some european markets so i was pinpointing a particular country to him that oh you need to get go to this country when you uh he, he's, he has gone back now. So I was like, when you go back, you need to get to this country because they use a lot of cocoa butter. And cocoa butter is one of the expensive, uh, you know, when it comes to cosmetic, um, cosmetic items or cosmetic products that you can ship out of the country, that you can export out of the country. So it was one of the pinpoints that I actually had to tell to tell him, so which country or geolocation are you targeting? Because you need to have all this in mind. You need to plan out all this uh, by the time you are going into big farm or say, uh, saying that you want to plant so so uh, commodity on 100 acres or 50 acres. Or, so 
this is one thing that you know a lot of our farmers are suffering from so if you are a farmer you understand that farmers don't get much money from what they plant around here because like for instance this year cassava price actually dropped a lot it dropped that even we that planted we would have planted it we couldn't even get uh, from the harvest when you compare both prices uh, especially from last year's price to this year's price so in when you plant cassava on let's say on 500 acres of farmland and the price that you are projecting which should be like maybe 40 something or a thousand naira per ton compared to last year's price but now it's now being sold for 20 20 something thousand naira per ton so the only way you can actually say oh i want to cover or make more profit or to actually even make more money a lot of money even more than something i could have made last year is to process the same crop and export is to process it and export but if you don't have that mindset already if you are not actually working towards that already you might not be able to profit from exporting you might not be able to profit from that uh, someone a very big a big time farmer contacted me contacted me uh, recently uh, they needed me to help them with with markets with markets so they want to they want to they are looking for for buyers for you know some of their farm produce this is a very big farm they have the all the equipment some equipment that i've not i've never even seen like uh, for processing you know for big dryers big uh washing machines you know uh, shredders you know when you when you that can produce like up to 20 30 tons it lasts like a container of, of you know harvest in a day or maybe in two hours and they can do that over and over and over and over in a day so one of the my advice for actually the ceo of the company was that look you have to set up the structure you need to set up a structure that will attract exporters to buy your products, you know, to, uh, I mean, uh, importers rather, importers from other countries to buy your products, you know? So you can have a situation just like we do locally that when you want to plant maize, for instance, when you want to plant maize on a very huge uh, portion of farmland, you know, there are some off takers you can go and call. There are some companies you can call and they will come, they will measure the, the volume of land you use to plant the maize. Maybe the maize is already like a month or going to six weeks old already, you know, and maybe it's on, on like 100 acres. They will come, they will view, they will value it and they will pay you. They will pay you like an advance for it. Maybe when once it's harvested and all that, they will pay you the balance. So you can also do this for export, for international markets, not just the, the local market alone. So when, when even foreign companies, you know, when they are purchasing or their procurement manager already sees your farm or whatever you are doing and they know that, oh, this is constant. This is something we can rely on that will be consistent, that is actually coming in. Then they begin a form of communication with you. They begin to interact with you. So where most farmers make that mistake is that they start running around after they've harvested so now that you've harvested your warehouse is filled up now you need someone to buy that's now when you are now searching for that buyer and all that so by the time the buyer comes because you need to sell immediately the pressure is now on you you know the buyer just throws in looks at it knows that the value of this thing is 50 naira, but the buyer is saying 20 naira. So um, because maybe the buyer has the money to actually buy everything at once, and the farmer does not, you know, you, you don't want to 
going on and okay, you sell little to this person, you sell little to that person. Then you are now the one begging the buyer to pay 30 naira. Then at the end of the day, maybe the buyer paid 25 naira. Then packed everything. So this is uh, like con the condition most farmers find themselves at the end of the day that they actually don't make enough money that they are supposed to make from what they are planting. So there is no better way to say it that if you can go from farm to export, if you can go from farm, go from uh, processing what you plant to exporting it to the international market, that's the best thing a farmer can do in Nigeria now. That's the best thing. That's how you can make your capital back, make profit, you know, and have money to So maybe you want to buy more land, acquire more land. That's the only way uh, that you can do that. It looks like I'm logged out. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you are logged yes, out before. Out. Yes. I can hear you. Okay. I just I just saw that now that I was logged out. Okay, so uh so now you can choose between uh, freshly harvested ginger. You can choose between, uh, you know, selling freshly harvested ginger. So to sell freshly harvested ginger, for instance, now it might not be, it doesn't mean you can't export that, but it means that you can't do a long distance export. That's what it means. You can't, so maybe uh, you have someone who needs fresh ginger in Benin. Who needs fresh ginger in, in Togo, in Niger, in um, in Cameroon, in Ghana, in Ivory Coast? You know, so it could be, it could still be around West Central African region that you need to export your fresh ginger. And it doesn't mean you also won't brand your fresh uh, ginger too, because when you harvest, once you wash, you make sure you wash it clean, uh, free of sand, free of anything. You dry the you know, the water at the back and all that, make sure it is, it's fine. You pack it inside good carton, good uh, aerated carton. You know, you just ask one of these uh, packaging company to produce cartons for you. you. Tell them the dimension, then you let them put holes into it, a lot of holes so that air can come inside. You pack it, you seal your carton, you load it into maybe a truck or something and you ship it off to the destination. So about when you want to do uh, oceanic uh, freight that has to do with long distance, maybe a month, two months, it's even on the sea. Then you have to dry your ginger to make it a split ginger or whole dried ginger. So if you are doing that also, it might not be in carton, it might just be in maybe sacks uh, that you've branded, that it's you know beautiful looking because that's also your product, you know, so you can choose uh, with your capacity or with what you have on ground, uh, where to actually focus on, where to actually focus on. So that uh, like uh, this year, this year, uh, this year's ginger price was actually very high, was very high uh, that a lot of people, we're not, we're not really uh, putting up, you know, the fight to make sure that, oh, I export my ginger, I export my ginger. And the reason is that exporters in Nigeria are not farmers. Merchants in Nigeria, I mean, agro-commodity merchants are not farmers. Um, who again, who again? Uh, even manufacturers, uh, pr producers are not farmers. So most people go to the farmer to buy at rock bottom prices. Uh, when the warehouses, they pay, they pay, uh, you know, you pay bill uh, for maintenance on warehousing. So in, uh, if, if let's say you have, you have 200 tons, of cashew nuts in your warehouse, you have to dry it at least 
you know, weekly when the laborers load it out to dry and all that, there's an amount you have to pay them uh, for a bag that they carry out. By the time you are done sun drying in the evening, you pack it, you load it back to the warehouse, you, you must also pay them for doing that because it's not a small job, you know, and it's, it's a very strenuous uh, thing. So you are still spending money every day also. So by the time it gets to export level that, oh, you are interacting with the buyer, the price will now be high. So the price can be like $4,000 a ton, $6,000 a ton. In fact, some exporters can sell dry split ginger for about $10,000, $15,000 a ton. And when you look at this, that same ginger, how much it came from the farm, from the farmer, might not be more than maybe 200,000 Naira a ton, 300,000 Naira a ton right now, or maybe 400,000 Naira a ton. So when you look at the gap, the gap is too much. The gap is too much. So it's actually better if you can get your own farmland, you know, and with the knowledge of what you get from this series, with the knowledge of how to, you know, operate, how to set up some structures that will attract uh, buyers to use, uh, importers to you, then you can start, you know, out that way that you are going to plant your own crop, process, package them, and export them. Because that is just the best way to do it. So another uh, case study is soybeans that I wrote here. So in soybeans, soybean exporter usually rely on specification. That is what the buyer expects from the product that they are going to ship to him or her. So this has to do with, you know, uh, most of the time specification on soybeans, it's about impurity, foreign matter, uh, humidity, uh, protein content, oil content, then the year of harvest. So some people can tell you, I want a new crop. I want 2022 crop, or I, I prefer last year's crop, depending on what they want to use it for, depending on what they want to use it for. So some people will say grade A soybeans, like uh, it's, it's very good. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the bean. It's, it is fit for human consumption and all that. Meanwhile, there is grade B soybean. The grade B soybean, is for animal feed. It's used for animal feed. So they'll tell you, oh, I want grade B, I want grade C. It's for uh, you know, feed stock. So they want to use it to process animal feed, maybe for fish feed, maybe for pig, uh, you know, so that kind of thing. Then other crops you can export from around here. You can plant turmeric, apart from ginger, you can plant sesame seed, millet, maize, cassava, uh, because you, you, you can convert your cassava, process it into cassava chips for for export. Then we have dried mango, melon, granite. Uh, we have lots of uh, crops or plants that you can export out of here, that you can export out of here. Then uh, in the supply chain uh, aspect, in the supply chain aspect, it's really for we that have our farm at a very far uh, distance away from where our port is located, maybe away from Papa Lagos, away from Calabar or Port Harcourt, the usual places where we have some ports that get battered. Uh, but most of the time, it's Lagos. So how far, how do you want to handle your logistics? How do you want to handle your movement? So the first thing I listed there is what type of contract are you looking out for? Is it long term or is it short term? Do you have, is the land, the farmland you are using, is it your own or is it something that you lease? Uh, maybe you only lease it for six months, for instance, or three months. Then you already know that uh, by the time I'm done with this particular uh, season, I can't use the land again. So you want to have all this in mind to know that maybe whether you are going long term or you are going short term. So this will help you to know how to process your farm or how to plan your farm. Uh, whether there are some parts that you have to cultivate now, but you leave some parts to later then, 
when it, when the parts we are cultivating, when the crops get to a stage, we start planting the next uh, part also, so that you know there won't be a time that you don't have commodities on ground or in your warehouse, or you don't have a particular crop in your warehouse. So you can split your farm into two, into four, into three. You plant section A now. In another two months, let's say what you are dealing with is soybeans and you have abundant water. Uh, you already have borehole and all that. So it's not like you need, uh, if there is no rain, you are not planting, you know, you are doing your own, your own thing. So you plant section B, then from there C, D, you know, you rotate it again. You know, so you need that planning to know the kind of export contract you're actually looking out for. So, you, that, so if you are going for long term, you are looking for a contract that requires you to supply maybe 500 tons, 1,000 tons monthly, every month, maybe 100. So you have some contracts that you might even look at it and think maybe they are ridiculously high. You know, so sometimes it might even be that you need to call your colleagues, your farmer friends, your, you know, and even ask them that, hey, you need to come and help me with, with this supply. Maybe my farm was only able to, produ to produce 300 tons, 500 tons, but I still need 100 tons more and all that. So this will help you plan ahead. This will help you to plan ahead. Then uh, how fast do you go from farm to production? Uh, how fast do you plant? Okay, uh, what was like the time that you spend when you, you know, when you plant the crop, uh, when you process uh, to bagging, to bagging it, uh, that it is ready for export. How long is it going to take you? Is it three months, uh, six months, a year? two years, so you just need all these things on ground to focus on, you know, to have a broad view of it. So, like, is it something that you need to hire or to get someone that can operate a machinery that you would have already told the person that, oh, I have so, 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 by so, so time I'm going to harvest, I will need you to help me to process or to shred or to trash, you know, that kind of thing. So they already know and they are looking forward. They are looking forward to it. So, uh, for instance, if your focus is soybeans, what are the farm processing structures you've put in place that will help you meet production targets and reach uh, export standard easily? So, one of the reasons I'm using soybeans as an area of focus is that soybeans is easy to. It has a shorter time frame from for production. You know, so uh, if you are if you are planting soybeans within three months, you should be able to harvest uh, your soybeans. I, I think there are even some some uh, new ver uh, varieties now that are even less lesser time frame. They are even lesser time frame. So, and it's one of the, because of the oil content, so we have soybean oil, which is also very uh, good oil, you know, in making food in uh, for different kind of processing, uh, uh there are some food products like some form of uh what i say biscuits cookies and all that that use uh this oil you know some cosmetics uh also use it uh they use it for margarine you know so there are different kind of products that have the need for it so it's one of those commodities that sell all the time that people export at all time at all time from Nigeria, from Nigeria. So it's one of those. So uh, how fast will you, are you able to do all this? So are you partnering, are you going to partner with someone in your area? Like maybe, um, maybe by the time you come out of your farm, there's this very huge building that you can use as warehouse. So are you going to talk to the owner of that warehouse to partner with, the person so that both of you will know that oh you are you know you are working together or you are doing something together. So then who are your logistics partners? Like who are the people that will help you to convey the uh, commodity to where it's going to to come coming down to Lagos, maybe from Kano, maybe from Kaduna. 
maybe from Enugun or from Owebi, from Abia, how do you want to move it? How do you want to do all this? So you need uh, operational partners, logistics companies. Even if you are going to be paying them, you still need them to form alliances with you or partners with you because when you need them, they might actually be busy. So even if they are not busy, they can tell you that they are resting or maybe they are tired or maybe, but because you already have formed have partnership on ground with them, they know that, oh, this is top priority. This is something we need to quickly do. So then uh, operational finance, because you need, as a farmer, you have the products, you have the harvest, you have everything. You've been able to, you know, uh, use your labor to process, to bag, everything is at the warehouse. So how do you move same from that warehouse to, to Lagos? So you need financing for all this. You need to spend, but you've already spent money, you know, in, in growing, in maintaining, in making sure everything comes out well, in making sure the crop comes out well. But now you need finance to just, you know, finish an export transaction. So it's very good. And you are in, in a better position to actually raise finance with your, harvest or with your produce than the average merchant, than the average merchant, than the average exporter. Because most times what the exporter will do or the merchant will do is to come and meet you, the farmer, and tell you that, oh, give me uh, 50 tons, give me 100 tons, I'll pay you 20%. Or when, I, when I'm done with the transaction, I'll come and pay you the money. So if I pay you 50%, and once I'm able to export and all that, I'll pay you the balance of 50%. So though in the value chain, there is always room and there's always space for everyone to work. There's always room and space for the farmer, for the merchant, the exporter, you know, everyone to actually do their thing. But sometimes it's also good as a farmer because that's where our profit is. That's where uh, capital uh, money really is uh, that we are supposed to get from the toil and toiling and toiling on the farm. You know, so all these finance, because you are the farm with your own farmland and you have the produce and harvest and all that, so you can, most logistics companies give, uh, will give you credit. Most will give you credit and they will give you finance. A lot of supply chain companies now in Lagos, in Abuja, in Port Harcourt, they do this a lot. So once they know that, okay, the value of the, of the items or of your harvest that you have that you want to move to Lagos, this is actually the what, or oh, this is the invoice that you invoice the person who is buying from you and all that. They are able to give you some sort of credit. They're able to finance you even in cash. So you move the item down, you pay your freight, you pay your you know, forwarding expenses and all that, and they load it and they move it. And once you receive your payments, you settle whoever you have to settle. Uh, so even for, for freight, this is one of the things that you uh, that you that you can use your financing to do, that you can use your financing to cover. Then um, how do you cover the gap between export and payment? You know, when you export, by the time the, the uh, what was it called? The vessel loads the container, you get your bill of lading, uh, you send it to the buyer and all that. It's not immediately that the buyer will pay you. The buyer might not even pay you like in the next one month. It might take you two months, it might take you three months for you to get your payment. So how do you cover between that time of export and payment? So this is also another aspect of finance where you have to show your financiers or your banks or uh, whoever you are talking to proof, evidence of everything that you've done, like the exports and all that, that you've exported these commodities or this harvest, this produce, so that they can, you know, finance, they can give you something in return. Like I, I have a, a bill of lading here. I collected it uh, uh, 
uh, I collected it last week, was it last week? Uh, yes, I collected it last week, uh, Friday, uh, by One Express, one of these logistics companies. I've not even opened it at all. And the reason I've not even opened it is the, the bill of lading is just around $10,000. It's just around ten thousand dollars. So let's say, let's say it's a bill of lading that is worth that is around hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars. I would have opened it, brought out the bill of lading, snap it to someone, snap it to maybe a bank or someone. Say, oh, look, I need money. I need money to come in. So you know they will ask uh, for your financial records. You ask for proof that you know you made the shipment, the company is your own. They'll ask for, you know, that's why when I was talking about the operational requirement at first, I listed those um, documents and some other things that you're supposed to have. So they'll ask you for proof. They'll ask you for a financial record, maybe six months uh, you know, account statement. They'll ask you for other bill of leadings, like of previous shipments like maybe three bill of lading and uh, three proof, proof of funds that the, the bill of lading that's of the shipment that you actually made that the payment actually came to your account. So they'll ask for like three of it. Uh, this is standard. What I'm saying now is standard. Uh, and uh, and uh, so once you provide all that, you know, and the evidence of the recent shipments that you want to finance, they will provide you at least about 90% of the value of the shipment. So let's say the shipment is $100,000. You can guess about $90,000 from this company. So like uh, one very good example, you can write this down, are the FinTech companies. Uh, there are some FinTech companies now that are into logistics and supply chain. Uh, so they do cross broad, uh, cross border uh, financing, cross border trade finance financing. That's what they do. So I have some who have communicated with me, who have you know called me. So if you are actually in the field and you are doing that, uh, they have their own way to know the people that are exporting. So most times or sometimes they might call you, they might chat you up, they might send you a message. So once you are sending something out or making a shipment, they will call you to tell you that if you need quick money or if you need quick cash after you've exported, they can actually provide the money for you. So, you know, so that's one way for you to cover that gap. So once you provide all that, you get your finances. So for some of us who don't have all those things on ground already, what we can do is to partner with an exo a, as a farmer. That's why I said in the value chain of the farmer, exporter, you know, freight forwarder, and all that, everyone has their own role to play. You can partner with a, a merchant or an exporter at first. Then by the time you have your own first successful shipment, second successful shipment, third successful shipment, you can, you know, stand alone yourself. Can stand alone yourself, do your own financing, get your own financing, uh, everything that you need uh, to make a successful trade. Okay, so please let's log back in because it's less than a minute. So once it stops, let's use the same link to log back in. So uh, local trade financing. So uh, local trade financing is all about, this is not exporting now, this is just we moving commodities. We moving common. Okay, okay. Uh, let me let me just take one or two questions before I move on because uh, I see that in the chat. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to. I 